My purpose today is to uh, look at human nature. I see your talents have gone beyond the mere physical level. Look at human nature through the lens of the Islamic intellectual tradition. Meet Professor William Chittick, a leading figure in Islamic and mystical studies. He's not just a scholar, he's a seeker of profound truths. In today's video, we explore his insights into the recovery of human nature. A student of the renowned Professor Nazar, Professor Chittick brings a wealth of knowledge to our exploration of esoteric wisdom. By intellectual tradition, I mean the more sophisticated expositions of Islamic teachings found in the books of Muslim scholars known to modern historians as philosophers and mystics. Your skills are now at the point of spiritual insight. By using the word intellectual, I have in view the distinction that is often drawn in Islamic texts between two sorts of knowledge, akli and nakli, that is intellectual and transmitted. By making this distinction, Muslim scholars want to remind us that people come to know things in two basic ways. Either they learn from others, or they recover what they already know. Most knowledge is of the transmitted sort. We have learned practically everything we think we know, language, history, law, scripture, science, from others. In contrast, intellectual knowledge cannot be learned by way of transmission. What is at issue is not information, facts, or theory, but rather the actuality of knowing that accrues to the self when it awakens to the root of its own awareness and intelligence. In trying to express the nature of intellectual knowledge, Muslim scholars commonly cite mathematical understanding as an example. Like intellectual knowing, true mathematical insight does not derive from learning or rational argumentation, but rather from the discovery of the logic and clarity of mathematics. When one perceives the truth of a mathematical statement, one cannot deny it because it is self-evident to the intelligence. In short, transmitted knowledge is acquired from teachers, books, and study. Intellectual knowledge is found when intelligence awakens to its own nature. Now, discussion of these two sorts of knowledge is common in pre-modern worldviews. Buddhist texts, for example, frequently refer to the distinction between conventional knowledge and supreme or ultimate knowledge. I have several questions. What is the highest technique you hope to achieve? To have no technique. Very good. What are your thoughts when facing an opponent? There is no opponent. And why is that? Because the word I does not exist. Thus we have the famous Zen analogy of the finger pointing at the moon. Transmitted knowledge can at best be the pointing finger. Intellectual knowledge is the moon. Let me think. Don't think. Feel. It is like a finger pointing away to the moon. Don't concentrate on the finger or you will miss all that heavenly glory. And seeing the moon demands a transformed and transmuted selfhood. In the final analysis, intellectual understanding occurs when no distinction can be drawn between the knowing self and the illuminating moon. In Islamic texts, this ultimate stage of knowledge is commonly called the unification of the intellector, the intellected, and the intellect. As with other traditional civilizations, Islam has given a very honored place to transmitted knowledge. Clearly, specifically Islamic knowledge, such as the Quran and the sayings of Muhammad, has been received by way of transmission. These two sources provide the foundations for Islamic law and dogma, that is for jurisprudence and theology. The two sciences that attempt to rationalize and codify Islamic practice and thought. 
Nonetheless, throughout Islamic history, various great teachers have reminded the community that transmitted knowledge is not an end in itself. Its real function is to serve as a framework for self-realization, that is, for the awakening of the intelligence that is innate to the human soul. Two traditions of Islamic learning have considered intellectual understanding as the goal of human life. One of these is philosophy, which took inspiration from the Greek legacy and is typified by figures such as Avicenna, who's well known in the West, and Mullah Sadra, who's much less known because he's much later, 17th century. The other is Sufism, which was based on the Quran and the model of Muhammad and is typified by people like Ibn Arabi, who is, in Islamic eyes, the greatest fruit of this coming together of uh, the three civilizations in Spain. Ibn Arabi, in his person, puts together Islamic philosophy, the whole Kabbalistic uh, dimension, and Islamic law. And so he's a, he's a synthetic figure who died in 1240. And if you remember, Professor Manokal recited a poem at the end of her lecture. That poem was by Ibn Arabi. It is not difficult to see why philosophy should be called an intellectual approach. But many people would object to putting Sufism in the same category. Most scholars understand Sufism as mysticism. And for various reasons, mysticism is commonly considered to be irrational. Denying that Sufism offers an intellectual approach to knowledge, however, rests largely on current meanings of the word intellectual. But the point I want to make is that Sufi teachers, like the Muslim philosophers, have never considered transmitted learning as anything other than a finger pointing at the moon. Now, as one brief example of a Sufi whose teachings are focused on the achievement of intellectual understanding, let me quote from someone who would not be considered an intellectual in, in any Western sense of the word. This is Shamsa Tabrizi, whose name is associated with the famous Persian poet Rumi, who died in 1273. Those familiar with Rumi's teachings know that far from being a mere poet, he was an outstanding seer, a sage, and a guide on the path to awakening and enlightenment. They will also have heard that Shamsa Tabrizi's intervention transformed Rumi from a conventional scholar, that is a scholar of transmitted knowledge, to an enlightened sage. Now, here are some of Shamsa's remarks about the scholarship of his age. Should sound familiar. The reason these people study in the universities is they think we'll become teachers, we'll get employment in the schools. They say one should do good deeds and act properly. They talk of these things in the assemblies so that they can get jobs. Why, Shams continues, why do you study a knowledge for the sake of worldly mouthfuls? This rope is for coming out of the well, not so that you can go from this well into that well. You have to exert yourself in knowing this. Who am I? What substance am I? Why have I come? Where am I going? From whence is my root at this time? What am I doing? Toward what have I turned my face? Now, it would hardly be possible to summarize the issues addressed by the intellectual tradition more succinctly than Shamsi Tabrizi has done in posing these questions. Those who have seriously engaged in this tradition have always focused on solving the mystery of their own selfhood. The goal has been to answer the perennial question of the meaning of human life. Seekers in the past have been striving to emerge from the well of ignorance, forgetfulness, self-centeredness, hatred, and narrowness that is the common lot of mankind. In their view, any knowledge that does not aid in the quest to escape from the well of ignorance is a hindrance 
on the path of achieving the full potential of human embodiment. But this understanding of the human situation is most famously captured in the Western tradition by Plato's myth of the cave. In the process of attempting to answer the questions highlighted by Shamsi Tabrizi, philosophers and Sufis have addressed a wide variety of issues, not least notions of subject, self, soul, and personhood. Their goal in explaining the meaning of these words, however, has not been to provide psychological theories or to tell people who they really are, but rather to point seekers in the right direction. They knew perfectly well that no one can achieve self-understanding by listening to the explanation provided by others. Teachers can provide the finger, but seekers have to see the moon for themselves. The overall perspective of Islamic civilization is summarized in the double testimony of faith. There is no God but God. Muhammad is the messenger of God. As traditionally understood, this formula distinguishes between intellectual and transmitted knowledge. Now in Arabic, the statement, there is no God but God, is called kalimat al-Tawheed, the sentence asserting a unity, that is the unity of God. The Quran presents Tawheed, as a self-evident truth lying at the heart of every prophetic message. The first of the 124,000 prophets sent by God was Adam, the last Muhammad. The Quran tells us that the function of all prophets is to remind people of God's unity. To speak of reminder is to say that there is nothing new or innovative about this knowledge. People already know that God is one which is to say that they have an innate intuition that reality is coherent, integrated, and whole. In Quranic terms, this knowledge pertains to the original nature, fitra, of human beings, that is, to the intelligence and self-awareness that distinguish human beings from other creatures. Hence, the first function of the prophet in, Islam, in the Islamic understanding is to help people recognize, that is, recognize what they already know. Here again, Plato provides a precedent with his notion of reminiscence. Now, to heed, the assertion of unity is utterly basic to the Islamic worldview and is the constant point of reference to, for the intellectual tradition. Philosophers take it for granted, even if they devote many volumes to explaining why it must be so and why it underlies all true knowledge. For their part, Sufis also take to heed for granted. And in their theoretical works, they also speak incessantly of the manner in which God's unity determines the nature of things. When we look at the traditional understanding of the formula of Tawheed, there is no God but God, we realize that there is nothing Islamic about it. It is an unremarkable statement about the universe, much as if we were to say the sky is up and the earth is down. Any rational person knows that reality is coherent, ordered, and somehow unified. And this knowledge lies behind every attempt to make sense of the world and the human situation. This is to say that the truth of Tawheed is universal. It has nothing to do with the historical or cosmic situation. Reality is that it is. The universe is, in fact, unified, as the word itself reminds us. As for the second half, that's all first half of the testimony of faith. As for the second half of the Muslim testimony of faith, Muhammad is God's messenger. This is by no means self-evident. Knowledge of Muhammad is not innate to human intelligence. No one can believe that Muhammad is God's messenger without having received knowledge about Muhammad from others. And in the same way, no one can know anything about the message that Muhammad brought, that is the Quran, without hearing about it. Once someone believes that Muhammad was in fact God's messenger, then that person will need to take his message seriously. This is the beginning of Islam as a religion, in the sense that pe most people understand the words today, the word. As for knowledge of Tawheed, unity, that pertains to human nature, irrespective of religion, history, and transmission. Now, we can summarize the role that these two sorts of knowledge have played in Islamic civilization in these terms. The goal of transmitted learning has been to gain the ability to think correctly and act rightly 
on the basis of what has been handed down from the past, namely the Quran, the reports about Muhammad, and the teachings of the pious ancestors. In contrast, the goal of intellectual learning has been to guide people on the path of awakening and self-realization. With these two approaches in view, we can look at the basic question raised by my title. How can we conceptualize human nature in the view of the intellectual tradition? Now, generally, the Quran depicts human beings as forgetful and ignorant. Nonetheless, they have the capacity to search for knowledge and to overcome ignorance. And this places upon them a moral and spiritual obligation to do so. They are exposed to the two basic sorts of knowledge by the nature of things. They receive transmitted learning from society and past generations, and they find through their own experience that they sometimes understand things without ever having been taught. As the Islamic tradition developed over time, theologians and jurists, who are the guardians of transmitted knowledge, took the position that people must submit to the teachings of the Quran and Muhammad in order to reach salvation after death. Sufis and philosophers, who are the guides to intellectual knowledge, took the position that the very nature of human intelligence calls upon people to strive for self-realization in this world without waiting for salvation in the afterworld. Now, in order to understand the manner in which the intellectual tradition has envisaged human nature, and this is the central issue of, of the whole tradition, we can meditate on the notion of Tawhid. Given that human beings are abysmally ignorant in face of the ultimate reality, how can they even think about it? The basic answer is in terms of names and qualities. We observe names and qualities in nature in it and in ourselves, and not to mention in scripture. We constantly use these names in everyday conversation, words like life, knowledge, power, desire, speech, hearing, and seeing. These seven are sometimes called the seven pillars of the divinity. Tawhid provides a formula, a meditative formula, through which the significance of these qualities can be quickly grasped. When applied to life, for example, the formula, there is no God but God, means there is nothing alive but the living, which is to say that there is no true life but the divine source of all life. When applied to knowledge, Tawhid teaches us that nothing knows but the true knower, which is to say that real knowledge, awareness, and consciousness belong only to the source of all knowledge, awareness, and consciousness. When applied to power, the form of Tawhid means there is no power but in God, the all-powerful. And the power of created things in face of God's infinite power is utterly ineffectual. Now, traditionally Muslim theologians, and they have analyzed each of them in much the same way. Philosophers like Avicenna have typically curtailed the discussion by looking at a limited number of fundamental characteristics of ultimate reality. He provides a list, Avicenna, of seven attributes, unity, eternity, knowledge, desire, power, wisdom, and generosity. Now, nowadays, when people talk about reality, they typically take the position of naive realism, well, not in this conference, but generally, and they reduce everything to the physical realm and its epiphenomena. In contrast, when Muslim intellectuals talk about reality, the first sense of the word is absolute reality which is called God in theological language. Philosophers prefer to use abstract terms, however, to talk about this first reality. Most notably, they call it wujud, a word that is usually translated as being or existence, but which also means, in Arabic this is very important, consciousness and awareness. The idea that reality designates, first and foremost, the infinite reality of being is rooted in Tawhid. There is nothing real but the, re but the real, that which is truly real, God. The first corollary of this statement is that everything other than the ultimate reality must be relatively unreal. The cosmos, which is defined as everything other than God, can only have a conditional reality 
It is this conditional reality that allows us to perceive ourselves and think about our situation. It is important to note that the definition of cosmos as everything other than God includes not only physical things, but also spiritual things, such as angels and souls, which are understood to be more real than physical things, but less real than God. To speak of more and less real is to say that relative reality has degrees. The great issue among the philosophers is not to prove that there is an absolute reality called wujud or existence, because that is self-evident but rather to clarify the distinction between reality per se and reality as it appears conditionally in things and in selfhood. Avicenna and others distinguish between the ultimate reality, the ultimate wujud, and the existent things, mawjudat, found in the cosmos by saying that the real existence is necessary, which means that it cannot not be. And existent things are contingent, which means that they partake of existence in a manner determined by the necessary existence. Now, in the intellectual tradition, nothing can be understood properly outside the context of Tawheed. In other words, the basic question to be asked about anything is this. How does its contingent and relative existence tie it back to the one real being? The cosmos as a whole is contingent upon its origin. And each thing within the cosmos has a unique situation defined by its own thingness. The thingness of each is a specific collection of attributes, qualities, and characteristics that make it this thing rather than that thing. Only real being itself has no thingness. Its infinite reality allows for no specificities that could separate it out and make it distinct. So it is utterly different from all things and simultaneously it displays its own qualities and characteristics in everything that exists. This is what Muslim theologians mean when they say that God is both transcendent and imminent, both utterly absent and omnipresent. In the world map offered by the intellectual tradition, the cosmos is understood to have come into existence through a process of exteriorization or sedimentation or reification. The infinite being in consciousness of ultimate reality embraces all finitudes and brings them into actualization in their appropriate contexts. But the contingent existence of the universe does not simply appear from the necessary being, it also disappears into the necessary being. Any primer of Islamic theology tells us that Tawheed has three basic implications. Everything comes from God, everything is constantly sustained by God, and everything also returns to God. In other words, absolute reality alone determines the unfolding of things and their ultimate reintegration into the one from which they arose. In short, two grand movements can be observed in the cosmos as a whole. One is that of exteriorization, the other that of interiorization. One is that of creation or cosmogenesis, the other that of dissolution or destruction. One is manifestation, the other disappearance. These two mov movements are given a variety of names. Among the most common are origin and return, a phrase that was used as a book title by Mullah Sadr and Avicenna. The origin is pictured as a, as a centrifugal and dispersing movement. The return is a centripetal and integrating movement. The two movements together are often depicted as a circle, divided into two arcs, ascending and descending. The arc of descent passes from the invisibility of oneness and indistinction, which characterizes the infinite being and consciousness of reality, into the visibility of manyness and thingness. The unfolding of possibilities is directed and governed by the very nature of wujud itself, of reality. In terms of Avicenna's seven attributes, the real existence is one, eternal, knowing, desiring, powerful, wise, and generous. As he puts it, it is the abs this infinite being is the absolute good. And it brings into being a, a good and beautiful universe ordered in a wise, compassionate, and generous way. If we fail to see the wisdom and generosity suffusing the universe, that is our failing, not that of the absolute good. In the world in which we find ourselves, the ascending arc of reality is more obvious than the descending arc. Though both are always present, 
In pre-modern times, the ascent was observed in the three kingdoms, the mineral, plant, and animal realm, which mark the bottom links of the great chain of being. In each successive ascending realm, the attributes of real being come to be more obviously present. In minerals, most attributes are concealed. In plants, intimation of qualities like knowledge, desire, and power begin to appear. In animals, these qualities are more pronounced and integrated. Their integration and unification allow for greater subjectivity and make possible a greater understanding and control of the environment. The highest observable link on the arc of ascent is human beings. In the human case, however, there is a radical break with the lower levels. In minerals, plants, and animals, the diversity of qualities and attributes is infinitely dispersed. And the specific qualities of each thing become manifest largely through the external form. In contrast, human beings are externally similar but internally diverse. The outstanding characteristics of human beings are found not in their external appearance or in their doings, makings, and accomplishments, but in the invisible realms of consciousness. It is their subjective access to the infinite realm of possibility that allows them to assimilate all ontological qualities and, if they so choose, to make these qualities manifest in the world and society through activity, artifacts, cultural productions, and technology. In the Quran, human beings are given a number of attributes that separate them from other creatures. Most salient, perhaps, is the statement that God taught Adam, that is the human being, the primal human being, all of them, all the names. God taught Adam the names, all of them. One of the mo most basic interpretations of this verse is that God created Adam by investing him with all of the divine names and qualities. In other words, God created Adam in his own image. A saying that was repeated by Muhammad and it was just a constant uh, object of medita meditation. Each thing in the cosmos displays some of the characteristics of the infinite reality of being through its own thingness. And this can be observed and deduced by studying and investigating the things. In contrast, the essential characteristic of human beings is that they do not have a specific thingness. In other words, the essential thingness of a human being is to be no thing, because each is made in the image of the imageless, the real being that transcends all beings and all things. When God instilled human beings with the divine image, he made their essential nature to be without specific description and without designated attribute. In, the short, in short, the essential definition of human nature is to be indefinable. The, the evidence for this is before our eyes in the be bewildering complexity and diversity of human cultures, languages, religions, and artifacts. This goes back to the fact that the infinite being has no specific image, or to put it otherwise, God's image is the image that embraces all possible images. For their part, human beings know instinctively as a corollary of their intuition of Tawheed that nothing limits them. All the attempts by modern scientists and academicians to answer the great and small questions of the universe, the natural realm, history, society, art, literature, simply illustrate the unlimited possibilities of the human substance made in the image of the imageless. Now, the important point here is that the whole realm of human phenomena pertains essentially to the realm of consciousness and awareness, and only accidentally to external appearances. This inner realm has no intrinsic limits because it is the unfolding of the arc of ascent, which leads inexorably back to the infinite origin of all things. What makes the unlimitedness of the human substance especially hard to see in modern times is the de facto assumption of scientism the reductionist ideology of the predominant forms of contemporary thought that human life ends with death. On the contrary, as traditional religions have always affirmed, and as the Islamic intellectual tradition has demonstrated convincingly, death is simply the first major transition in the unfolding of infinite human nature. Certainly, physical embodiment is a necessary stage so that human beings can begin the process of bringing the divine attributes into manifestation. But the full potentialities of manifestation 
are held back by the limitations of physicality. This is perfectly obvious to all of us as soon as we recognize, for example, that the realm of imagination is infinitely more vast than the realm of physical possibility. On the outside, we are limited, but in the inside, we are not. This is why Ibn Arabi points out that death is a process through which our perception of reality is turned inside out. The limited realm of physicality is interiorized, and the infinite realm of imag imagination is externalized, thereby becoming the new landscape of our unfolding self. Molasadra demonstrates philosophically that after death, every human individual, whether of the saved or the damned, will come to possess an entire world greater than the present world and not strung on the same string, to use his word, as any other world. In order to suggest some of the relevance of this extremely brief review of the teachings of the intellectual tradition, let me come back to the questions posed by Shamsi Tabrizi. Who am I? What substance am I? Why have I come? Where am I going? Now, speaking for the intellectual tradition, Shams is saying that the only truly human reason to search for knowledge is to solve the riddle of our own existence. The answers to all his questions circle around the qu answer to the first, who am I? The intellectual tradition points out that the question cannot be provided by language or transmitted learning. At best, Language can suggest what our true nature is not. Each human being is the image of the imageless, the name of the nameless, the trace of the traceless. It follows that clinging to scientific or philosophical or historical or anthropological or religious explications of human nature is either to miss the point entirely or to cling to the finger and forget about the moon. I will not try to run through typical answers to Shams' questions which in any case are meant to highlight the inadequacy of transmitted learning. Instead, let me quote a few represented verses of his great student, Rumi, the person who immortalized Shams. Rumi's poetry is characterized, among other things, by the manner in which it catches the urgency of the quest for self-realization. There are a few lines of Rumi, which I hope will lighten uh, this a bit, and are typical, I mean, Rumi, perhaps you know, has 120,000 verses of poetry, and he's one of the greatest teachers of this whole tradition. Form comes into existence from the formless, just as smoke is born from fire. If you enjoyed our content, please share and subscribe, and please watch more of our videos. Cheers and namaste. When the opponent expands, I contract. When he contracts, I expand. And when there is an opportunity, I do not hit. It hits all by itself.